it says up here, smile, have fun, play nice. Um, not in my profession. <laughs> I uh, had a paper planned, a great big paper planned for today, and then I uh, noticed an article in the Salt Lake Tribune on last Saturday about the fair conference in which uh, Scott uh, mentioned that we don't attack people personally, we don't deal with personal attacks. So you're safe, George. I, I can't give that talk, so I had to do something different. My topic, and I'm going to go through some of these things very quickly because I think the more interesting part of this presentation is hearing from the man himself, George Throckmorton. But um, over the years, uh, George and I had a interesting conversations that we've talked about, reference to uh, the Hoffman case and others. That we we have uh, we like to quote movies, statements out of movies, and our favorite one that relates to Hoffman and what I think is leads out in the myth-making of the Hoffman case is a statement made at the end of a movie called The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, starring John Wayne, Jimmy Stewart, my, I, my opinion, the greatest Western of all time. And for those who don't remember this movie, I'll run through it very quickly. The movie starts with Jimmy Stewart and his wife returning to a little town in the West called Shinbone. He's been a U.S. Senator and been an, an ambassador and he's returning with his wife to this little town to bury an old friend named Tom Donovan, played by John Wayne. And as they come into town, the local reporter <laughs> sees him and then grabs the editor and they come over and says, what is this great statesman, this senator, doing in our little town of Shimbone? And they say, we're here to bury your friend. And the editor pushed the issue, we need to talk to you, well, who is this Tom Donovan? So Jimmy Stewart agrees to talk with them and be interviewed. And he relays the story about as a young lawyer, he came to town, got involved in the local politics, and came into conflict with a local outlaw named Liberty Valance, played marvelously by Lee Marvin. And during the conflict and the fight over uh, becoming a state from a territory, he is challenged to a duel by Liberty Valance. At the same time, he's in competition with, Jim, uh, with John Wayne over the girl. Well, after, uh, uh, after the election for delegates, he meets Liberty Valance on the street and shoots and kills him. He now becomes a hero and uh, known as the man who shot Liberty Valance. They go to the territorial convention and he decides to leave when he's pressured it or accused of being a murderer. And as he's about to leave, John Wayne pulls him aside and explains to him that you did not shoot Liberty Valance, because during that shooting, I was in the alley and I shot and killed him, not you. And they reenact that scene. He then proceeds to go back in, become the delegate, they get statehood, and uh, he becomes governor, senator, and wins the girl. Well, after he's explained this whole story and the reporter's writing all the notes, the editor takes these notes, tears them up, and throws them in the fire. And he's asked, well, Mr. Editor, why did you do that? He got up, turned and looked at Jimmy Stewart and said, this is the West, sir. When the legend becomes fact, print the legend. <laughs> this fits in perfect for Mark Hoffman. Let me share quickly some of the examples I believe exist. And some of these are kind of fun. Some of these we've all heard. First one is uh, our friend Ed Decker from Saints Alive in Jesus. This is on his webpage. He has a book called Bearing the, Truth of, Bearing the Testimony of Truth, compiled and edited by a Derek S. Hardenshaw. And it's been on there for a few years, and it, this morning it still was. This is a personal manuscript written by this gentleman. And there's some editorial notes that Ed Decker wrote at the beginning. This manuscript was completed and submitted during the brief time that the Mormon Church had accepted as true a fraudulent work generally called the White Salamander Letter by the infamous forger of Mormon manuscripts, Mark Hoffman. So we're talking about 1984. We have notified the author that this needs to be cleaned up and removed from the book and will make the correction as soon as we receive the corrected copy. Okay. It, is still, it still is interesting 
that the LDS Church created new doctrine to explain that a white salamander was really an angel. And when the hoax was revealed, it just as suddenly undid the doctrine, all without an apology or a blush. Wow. That, that's kind of, you know, to eliminate something that never was really there, but I find that kind of humorous that we had a doctrine as such. I must have missed that meeting. <laughs> Next one is uh, an article out of the Salt Lake City Weekly from March of 2003. And it's a story about Gerald and Sandra Tanner and Utah Lighthouse Ministry. And in reviewing the um, Hoffman case, uh, it says here, uh, while many were taken by the notorious document forger and bomber Mark Hoffman, Gerald, with typical uncompromising accuracy, was not bamboozled. Collectors of historical documents from the LDS Church to the Library of Congress and Sotheby's were buying Hoffman documents as fast as he could manufacture them. Hoffman sold forged letters of famous uh, Americana, and uh, his major focus was forging early Mormon historical documents that were extremely damaging to LDS doctrine and early church leaders. All the while, only Gerald Tanner remained unimpressed and unconvinced of their authenticity. Now we're talking about all these documents, and in 1984 publicly announced his misgivings, calling Hoffman a forger. 1984, this is a year before the, the homicides. I wondered about this. Now, it's pretty clear that, that uh, Gerald and Sandra had some serious doubts and problems with the Salamander letter, but not all of them. So not too long after this article came out, I visited uh, with Sandra Tanner at their home in their bookstore, and I asked him, is this a misprint? Is this a misunderstanding by the weekly? And this is what Sandra told me. No, no, Gerald did have doubts about all the documents and really believed that Mark was a forger, but he had no solid proof. Okay, this is 18 years after the fact. Now this is being revealed in this article, but I have some serious problems with that in the fact that in the, some of the writings of the Tanners following the homicides, and, and I, I'm making a little side note here because they made reference to the bombing forgeries of Hoffman. I, one thing that has been amazed me over the years, we always refer to Hoffman as a bomber or the bomber forger. We seem to be afraid to say what he is. He's a murderer. The forgeries and the bombings are secondary to the fact he killed two people. So <laughs> if I had my preference, we'd call him what he is, a murderer. But anyway, I asked Sandra that, and she just said, well, he just didn't have any proof. Following the, the uh, homicides, in some of the writings, they suggested that Mark wasn't that good of a forger or writer, that he must have had help. And they suggested that there was a, another individual who was forging the documents, and Mark was the middleman. And when this person either died or stopped doing the forgeries, Mark started doing his own, and that's when they became sloppy and so forth. Even as of last October, at a conference uh, sponsored by uh, an organization George belongs to, the Southwest Association of Forensic Document Examiners, Sandra and Gerald were there, and she was even asking people who were there if they had any ideas if anybody was helping uh, Mark. So I'm getting two different stories here, but the significance of this is the fact that you read a lot of the web pages and some of the chat rooms, and it's they always say Gerald was the only one that knew that Mark was a forger. Everybody else believed him. And that isn't true at all. There were others that had doubts, too. But uh, I find that has one of the myths that have started. Another one of the myths that is frequently read about is the uh, idea that there was going to be no trial of Mark Hoffman because the church did not want information passed out. And the fact that the leadership of the church, whoever they are, forced a plea bargain. Uh, the man that will be preceding me here, Mr. Throckmorton, has explained to me that on the day he was asked to leave employment from the Salt Lake County DA's investigator following the case, he was there when District Attorney Yoakum instructed Bob Stott, the lead investigator, lead prosecutor, that he will plea bargain the case. I've also heard from the mouths of Jerry D'Elia and Dave Briggs and a few others people involved with the case that the church had nothing to do with the plea bargain. This came strictly from Mr. Yoakum. And yet this is another story that you will read on web pages and chat rooms that the church forced the plea bargain because they didn't want President Hinckley to testify or, have to, or any other general authority. Now another fun one that I, that I found that was interesting is this 
is this document here. This, I don't know, oh, nope. here we go. This is the infamous <laughs> Psalm of Spalding, Sidney Rigdon land deed document that Mark uh, came across. Actually, it's a legitimate old land deed where a gentleman named Asa Spalding is selling some land to his wife's cousin, Jesse York. Well, Mark somehow got a hold of it, where or when, we don't know, but he proceeded to make some changes. Here you see down at the bottom the name Solomon Spaulding. Over here you can see the name Sidney Rigdon. Now this is an interesting document because for years on that Spaulding issue that the claim was they didn't know each other and here would be some proof that they knew each other. But it turns out these were added names. As you see over here on the date, it says 1822. Well, the actual date is 1792. Mark added it, the date at the top, 1822. This was a document that he showed Elder U. Pinnock and um, uh, to where U. Pinnock went and signed for the $186,000 loan to possibly purchase a McClellan collection. In fact, Mark claimed this was part of the McClellan collection. Um, a few weeks after showing it to Elder uh, Pinnock, he decided he needed some quick cash, so he took it down to Cosmic Airplane and sold it for $400, even though the guy who bought it, Steve Barnett, said there's a problem with the dates because Spaulding died in 1816. <laughs> and if you went to the original date, 1792, Sidney Rigdon hadn't been born by then. <laughs> but Mark convinced him, he says, well, that's not the same Solomon Spaulding, but will you buy it for the Rigdon autograph, which he paid the $400 for? Now, a few years ago, a book came out. I don't know if you can see it, but it's called Mormon Conspiracy by a Charles Wood. Got it at the Utah Lighthouse Ministry. And this is what he writes in here. The First Presidency was so impressed with Hoffman's discovery of the Anton transcript that they called a press conference at which they announced the new discovery and commended Hoffman for his efforts. Hoffman followed the Anton transcript with several non-faith promoting forged documents which were quickly bought up by the First Presidency and were hidden from the membership in the public. One of these forged documents included one that linked Sidney Rigdon, second in command of Joseph Smith, to Salma Spaulding. Okay, this document here. Now in 2002 when I was reading this book, I had to read it a number of times. I had to wash my eyes out to make sure I was actually reading it because at the particular time as I read this in my apartment, this document that you see in front of you was sitting on my table in my apartment. See, because I owned it. The church never owned it at the time. Because it went from Cosmic Airplane, was used and examined by George and in part of the investigation, and then it would return to Cosmic Airplane, at which time the owner of Bruce Roberts sold it to Ken Sanders in 2000, and I bought it from Ken Sanders in 2000, in August of 2000. Now, right now, in, in October of 2004, I donated it to BYU, so it's preserved down there. But here is a myth that this man is saying the church bought it and one of the documents they bought to hide, and the church never owned it to 2004. I again asked Sandra Tanner, in fact it was funny because not too long after that I was on an airplane to uh, Pasadena to speak at a Sunstone Symposium again with George and happened to get on the same flight with Gerald and Sandra Tanner and sat next to them on the plane. And so I asked him about this, since I'd bought the book from there, and I mentioned, well, you know, there's an error in the book, and Sanders says, oh, really? And I showed it, showed it to him and says, you know, this is wrong. Well, how's that? You know who owns that document? Sanders says, who? I said, me. And there was that long pause of look between her and Gerald looking at me, and she quickly recovered and said, well, you know, there's so much information material out there that he could have been mistaken or got bad information. Now think about it. That is a very true statement. <laughs> and over the 20, 21 years now, that has been exactly the problem we've had with uh, this case. We have this idea that the church was buying these documents to hide them, and yet a book here by Dean Jesse, The Personal Writings of Joseph Smith, published in 1984, not 1884, 1984, <laughs> has six of the documents listed in here. Majority of the documents that Mark forged were not controversial, were not 
testimony shaking. They were simple little things. There was no reason to hide them, no reason to have press. Yet today you can read on some web pages, like our friends from Recovery from Mormonism, who have these great theories that the church was buying these things to hide them, spending millions of dollars so that no one would ever see the light of day. Now I'm thinking, okay, all these other documents are being bought by the church and other collectors, very publicized in a lot of cases. We only have two that could be questioned of having been hidden, one being the uh, uh, Josiah Stoll letter and the other one was the letter from Bullock to uh, Brigham Young, reference to the Jill Smith blessing. But, and there might, if you read victims, there may be explanations on why these things were not immediately released. But now we have people talking about the church hiding these things. And I'm saying, well, if the church is as evil and, and satanic as you make it, why would the church buy documents at high prices just to hide them? That's why a man invented matches and paper shredders. Yet they're kept. Why is that? I mean, if you know, give them credit. If we're going to be sinister, let's go all the way. But we still have them. In fact, uh, last year, uh, during this, um, oh, actually it's been a few years, uh, Kenny Sanders had a, a uh, symposium in 2002 on it, and they had found another document they've, in the uh, art, church archives that they realized had come from Hoffman. And these things are still out there. So it's, again, a myth that has just taken a life of itself. Um, let me give you some pointers what to do when you hear various things and read them. And again, a lot of people here, here like me, you kind of browse the, the internet and recover, and they all have talking. I mean, the spiritual arm twisting that one claim this week they did on prominent rich Mormons to buy these documents for them. Um, first of all, consider the source. Consider the source of the person writing these things. Number two, realize that during this whole time, a lot of people were getting information about these documents and material, but the person they were getting it from was from Mark. And Mark was very good at lying and telling stories. And just because you may have two persons who are closely involved with them, and they tell different stories, doesn't mean these people are lying. You've got to find out where they got their information. And the same thing goes for other people who had information, sometimes they got it from friends or acquaintances who got it from Mark. And the same thing with, during the police investigation, they were hearing stories from people who had talked to Mark and they were passing it on. And they were confused sometimes because the stories weren't clicking or these were told, but other people like the church authorities aren't telling us the same story. You'd be very careful about that. Also, that because of the nature of the, the case, the homicide, that made a lot of people nervous and a lot of people didn't know how to handle themselves and, uh, or how to deal with it because you don't usually in your life come across being involved intimately in a, in a uh, homicide case. So sometimes people's initial reactions weren't what the police liked. But as George can tell you, that after he was able to get in there, that they became very, the church became very cooperative. Although the story goes the church was not cooperative, and some people have claimed that even President Hinckley led a stalling of the case, that he was interfering with the investigation. Um, George can probably give us some highlights on, on his feelings on that. But um, be very careful about people who might take a story and embellish. I have a great one that, that relates here to FAIR, of people taking information and getting it miscrewed. A few months ago, uh, Scott and FAIR was... Uh, kind enough to publish a letter that I wrote to Scott, reference to some items on the Dead Leaf Scroll, this lead plate that was found down in Page, Arizona, at Leaf's Ferry, a few years ago. Well, I'd made a comment that I had thought was true, that a document, I may even have it here someplace, here we go, written by Mark Hoffman in prison, listing the forgeries that he had done. Now, I had always thought and been told that it was following a suicide attempt when he was up at the hospital that this is when they found it during a, a search of his cell. Well, rereading some of the books, I discovered that didn't happen after his suicide. That happened a few months earlier, that when he was being interviewed, referenced some threats that he had made at, at George and some of the uh, members of the Board of Pardons. They did a cell search, and they came up with this list. So even I had bad information that I sh wrote a letter to the Deseret News on that, and I put it in the, the article. Now I'm going to have to change it. 
happens. But this, I've seen this happen all the time. Bad information that no one will tend to be deceiving, but you just hear something and your own mind regurgitates it and, and comes out differently. So we have to be careful of that. Oh, by the way, you will notice down here at the bottom the name John D. Lee. Okay, just, just a thought. Also be careful when people talk about the Hoffman case where they have information, but they give you no names or source. This is one of the things that Mark liked to play, and people willing to go along with it keep secrets. And we still have it. I can't tell you. I got this all the time from George. I can't tell you. And then I threatened to break his legs, and then he still wouldn't tell me. So anyway, I'm going to turn it now the time over to George so we can hear what he has to say. But before I, I turn it over to him, I have, uh, want to make some personal comments and, about Mr. Throckmorton. And these are nice things, so you don't have to worry, Scott. Back in 1991, I came over from Colorado because my career was going down the tube and my love life wasn't there anymore. And uh, through my good friend Van Hale, I worked for, in his business for a while. But in 1994, I hired on to work in the crime lab of the Salt Lake City Police Department. Got back into my, my uh, chosen career. A year later, they changed the supervisory of the crime lab from an officer or sergeant to a civilian, and they brought in George Throckmorton. And uh, the thrill that I have, have had for the last 10 years of working under his direction, literally sitting at his feet, hearing stories and information about the Hoffman case has been one that has not only enriched my, my professional career, but also my advocation of, of things Mormon. And he has been kind enough to invite me into his life and his research, included me on things, even though he sometimes would play games like with the John D. Lee scroll, but that's another story. I want to tell you how much I have appreciated the opportunity to get to know him as a friend. I care about him dearly. He is a dear friend and I love him dearly. Um, and I hope that he's here with us a long time because there is so much to share with us. And I want to close with this, and as George comes up, a uh, question that I have of him, reference to a, a, a statement that I read here in Mormon Mur Murders, one, the greatest book on the case, I'm sure. And this is uh, during the time that George and his associate Bill Flynn were examining the documents down at the church archives. And this is what it says, on the day Flynn left for Arizona, Bill Flynn is from Phoenix, Arizona, a church delegation led by Gordon Hinckley visited the conference room. They looked suspiciously at all the equipment while uh, Throckmorton and Flynn explained the process. They asked some questions, but to Flynn's astonishment, never asked the most obvious question of all, are the documents genuine? George, as you come up here, I'd be very interested to hear about this experience. Uh, but what's it like to have be in the middle of this visit, have the leader of the church, although at the time he was a counselor, but the man leading the church who became the prophet. What was that experience life? Maybe you can share with us. And, and what do you think why he didn't ask that question when he was there? In, you were there in his presence. If I can respond to Mr. Mayfield's question. <clears throat> As I advance in age, I have a tendency not to remember certain things and to remember other things even more than they actually happened, I guess. But as President Hinckley came in to visit us that day, I don't remember it at all because it just never happened. <laughs> uh, in fact, the closest association, and some of you may have heard this story, I've told it once before, the closest association I ever had with President Hinckley was because of my uh, friends. I've been in law enforcement, as was mentioned, almost 40 years. And my son used to work at the church office building it was his job to get the cars ready for the general authorities to take to their various assignments. And this is the story that I heard about President Hinckley, which took place several years ago. He likes to hot rod, is that the right expression? And as he came to pick up a new car, 
they always have a chauffeur to, to drive around the uh, first presidency and some of the apostles that can't drive too well. But as he came and saw the new car and his chauffeur was ready for him, he looked at it and he said, I've always wanted to drive a new car. Is it all right if I drive? Well, what's the chauffeur going to say? No. But the chauffeur said, well, you know, I've always wanted to sit in the back seat, too. <laughs> so as they started driving down to Provo, uh, President Hinckley's foot got a little bit heavy. They were going a little too fast. And as he looked in the mirror after hearing kind of an unusual noise, he saw some red and blue lights flashing behind him. And he pulled over to the right, and the highway patrolman come up and looked in the car and went back and got on the air and, and called his dispatch and says, I need to speak with my supervisor. <laughs> and the supervisor got on and said, what's wrong? And he says, I just pulled over a very important person. And he said, well, who is it? Is it Mayor Rocky? He says, no, more important than him. He said, well, is it the governor? He says, no, more important than him. Is it the President of the United States? He says, no, nope, more important than him. <laughs> he said, well, who is it? He says, I really don't know, but President Hinckley is his, his chauffeur. <laughs> That's the only story I know of President Hinckley. That's the closest I've ever come to him. But I can say this, my involvement in this case, uh, again, lasted for 16 months. Uh, I entered the case about uh, six weeks after the bombings took place. I was working for the Attorney General's office at the time as an investigator of white collar crime with a background in uh, forensic examination of documents. And there's many, many stories, and the one thing I learned relating to what Steve said is that uh, even the investigators have different theories on what happened. There were 11 of us for 16 months, and if you talk to one investigator, he will say one thing. You talk to another one, he will say something else. And the reason being is we did different interviews we spoke to different people. And about every morning we would meet together as a group and discuss what had happened. And so I heard a lot of stories from the other investigators. And then we would get our assignments, and then we would go out to conduct our investigation. There are a lot of things that I heard and that I experienced firsthand that contradict so many things that are in the book, the various books that's out there. Uh, what I've done today, I understand, uh, we've only got 20 minutes left if I understand how much time I have. And uh, there's supposed to be some cards being passed around. Are those questions? Okay. I'm not going to tell you a whole lot about my involvement other than I'm going to ask quest answer questions that may be here. And uh, if anybody else has any, raise your hand now and do it, because in about 10 minutes I'll be answering them. Uh, most of you know a lot about this case. And as I've given talks in the past, I talk about the elementary things that have happened. And I'm not going to do that today. I'll be happy to answer any questions. But what I have is a brief overview of many things. I t took over 700 slides of different documents. I've never shown them. I never will be able to show them. We spent three days once in our professional organization in Palm Springs, California, several years ago to go over them. And I was unable to, to show them all then. But uh, what I have done is put a montage of uh, slides together, which will give you a, a brief, but more or less a thorough overview of the case itself. And I'm going to need some help up here on how to turn this light off so we can start the others going. And then when we're through, I'll try and answer these questions. 
There's three questions up here, which gives me about a minute each. Oops, four, five questions. That gives me a minute each. In your opinion, what do you think caused Mark to turn to the dark side? I have no idea. I don't know him. I don't know anything about him. All I know is the documents. How does anyone tell a Hoffman forgery? I don't know. Myself and Bill Flynn did research for six months before we finally figured out how he did his forgeries because they were so unique and used techniques that we had never seen before. As I get documents now uh, asking if they're his, for instance, one of the things I'm sure a lot of you have heard is about the cracked ink. Well, realize it. It's not always cracking, and it only shows the particular degree of magnification. So if you see cracked ink, that doesn't mean it's forged. All that means is it's cracked. So it's difficult to tell, and that's one of the reasons why he was successful. It takes so long to do an examination. On the salamander letter, for instance, I spent 120 hours on that one page. Uh, who can afford to pay my fee to get a document examined if I'm going to spend 120 hours on it? Of course, I don't spend that long on all of them. Do you know who the anonymous Park Service employee who discovered the scroll was? Yes, I do. <laughs> In your opinion, which book most accurately reflects the events surrounding the case? Obviously, the one I wrote and that's sitting in the back. <laughs> Any possibility Mark forged the Mormon will? Is that the Howard Hughes will? No, nah, this was before his time. It was found in 1976, so I don't think so. I've been told by someone at church archives that Mark Hoffman had been poking around Norwich, New York prior to Wes Walter's discovery of the Neely Dezang bills for the 1826 trial. How far-fetched would a Hoffman connection to these documents be? I went back to New York in April to look at that document. Um, I, I don't know when the church is going to release They're hiding it again, okay? I don't know when they're going to release the results of it. I don't know whether the people in Norwich have released it, the historian back there. So I don't feel free to discuss that at this particular time. When they, hand it, when they hire me, I do it uh, confidential. Secret. Yeah, secret, as Steve said. I, I, I do it secretly. Uh, but anyway, uh, the question does not ask whether the document is genuine or not. The question says, uh, did Hart, Mark Hoffman, was he back there? Well, he was back there, but not at the time this document was found. So Steve has some things he wants to elaborate on. And all I can say is uh, thank you very much for allowing me to be here. Uh, if anybody has any special questions, I'd be happy to answer them if I can. Thank you very much. Quickly, uh, he skipped this. Do we know the name of the anonymous Park Service employee? Well, he's not anonymous. His name is Alan Malmquist. He's been down there for 40-some years. Uh, best way I can describe Alan is the fact he's the man with the keys. He's the one that when George and I went down there to tour the Lee's uh, Fort, he was the one that got us in. He's been a very helpful person, and as we've examined the scroll, been a great supporter. This past spring, I went with a tour down with a we were State University to Lee's Ferry, and he was more than glad on his day off to come and give a tour. Uh, very congenial, very friendly, very open, and uh, both George and I are very impressed with him. Are we fairly certain that this, the John D. Lee scroll, was a Hoffman forgery? Uh, everybody kind of assumes that. Best answer I can give you is I have a $100 answer and a 10 cent answer. $100 answer is that there's no hardcore proof or evidence that Mark had anything to do with it, but there is circumstantial evidence that may connect him to it or may show it might be part of him that I am not willing to excuse him as a, to use a legal term, suspect in manufacturing or producing the deadly scroll. That's my $100 answer. 10 cent answer, I don't know. So, anyway. <laughs>